OK, so in this lecture, I'm going to take you through the social class and crime section of the specification. And what we'll be covering is looking at the trends and patterns in relation to social class and crime and some of the probable issues that um, arise with that. We'll then focus in on working class crime and explanations for the trends in working class crime before looking at white -collar and the explanations of white collar and corporate crime and why we, perhaps we see more middle class and upper class people engaging in that behaviour. So essentially you can pause the video at any point you like, take um, notes as we go, and then using the notes grid that is in the ISB and on the remote learning plan, just check if there are any gaps in your knowledge. And on the ISB, you need to prioritise each of the questions and each of the grids so I can see if there are any areas that perhaps I need to go back over or if there are anything any there's anything that's not particularly clear so by next lesson um, I would like to see that that part of the ISB is complete and when you have done that click submit on the assignment so that I can go and have a look so let's get started then. Um, and first of all, when we're looking at trends in um, crime by social class, we break it down into two areas, really. So we're talking about prison population and arrests by the police. And we're also talking about the types of crime and how that relates to class. So in terms of prison population, there's no actual official tracking of class within prison populations. And there are a number of reasons for that. The main one being class is a very difficult um, concept to quantify. And depending on how you define different levels of social class will determine where somebody sits. For example, if you're using um, household income as your um, system of defining class, someone might be considered as middle class or working class um, because of how much money they bring into the home. But if you're using educational level, they may not be bringing in that much money, but they have a high level of qualification. So in that situation, are they working class or are they middle class? The other reason why it's it, uh, there's no official tracking of class and prison populations is it's not something that is asked again linking back to that theory that idea that most people do not know what their social class is there is no official government level system for saying this is working class this is underclass this is middle class this is upper class this is the criteria you need to meet in order to be in this class so officially they can't track it however Unofficially and sociologically, what we tend to see when we're looking at class in relation to income, to culture, educational level um, and things like that, there do appear to be more working class people in prison than middle class people. Um, and the population of a prison um, often reflects the arrest levels because you've got to be arrested before you can go to prison you don't just get arbitrarily sent to prison for no apparent reason um so we can assume that working class people are more likely to be arrested they are more likely to be engaged in activity with the police that's not to say that they're more criminal it might just be that they are more likely to be involved in the criminal justice system in some way now, looking at the types of crime, what we tend to see is working class people tend to be associated and um, in prison for what we refer to as blue collar or street crime. And that's things like theft, burglary, violence, sexual crimes. So these are crimes that uh, sometimes have a monetary gain, so the utilitarian type crimes, but they're crimes that are also more um, detectable. 
somebody knows when they've been a victim of theft somebody knows when they've been a victim of violence so these crimes tend to be more detectable middle class people tend to be more involved in white collar crime and i'll come on to definition more detailed definitions about white collar crime shortly but white collar crime is when you're using your position within um, your company or within your job to your own benefit and then you've got middle class and upper class people who tend to be more involved in corporate level crime and this is again i'll go into more detail about this in a second but this is where um, somebody commits a crime for the benefit of the company they don't necessarily benefit out on their own but that it's for the benefit of the company maybe it's profits maybe it's getting um better um trading deals or increasing stock prices but it's about the company not the individual so what i want to do now is actually go into a bit more detail about the difference between working uh, white collar and corporate crime we've talked about street level crime and blue collar crime quite considerably so this is just to make sure that you are very clear on what we're talking about in terms of white collar and corporate crime please don't misunderstand white collar crime is not does not equal middle class crime there are working class people who commit work, um, work white collar crime just as there are working middle class people who commit blue collar or street crime but white collar crime is about is not a synonym for middle class crime so what do we mean by white collar crime the definition given by carowell i'm probably mispronouncing that horrifically is the white collar crime which is sometimes referred to as occupational crime so you might see that um occupational crime referred to in some textbooks or on some websites and things and that is just another word and not just another way of saying white collar crime and as corral carowell or this person puts it it's when an individual one person or maybe a very small group of people abuse their position at work for personal gain at the expense of their employer okay so the person that is the or that's the victim here is the business or the employer okay and examples we can look at here are things like fraud expenses um fraud um embezzlement that's what i was looking for embezzlement um and things like that so it, it's not generally well not ever violent action okay it tends to be more paperwork based i guess you could say so to give you some examples of um white collar crimes that we've we've seen in society the first one which is quite a good one to use is the mp's expenses scandal in 2009 when it was published how uh, the claims that um mps were making for their expenses and it's it, it was disgusting some of the things that people were putting on their expenses their second house in um london they're allowed to have but a second house in their constituency not so much um employing their partner or their children as part of their consul um, constituency stuff but not actually making them do any work um thousands of pounds worth of gifts for um party donors or for taking them out for drinks to get them to donate to the political party so when this was exposed um and obviously mp's expenses comes from public money it comes from taxation so we as the public were paying for the for these things for these mps now in total four mps out of the 600 and however many it is mps there are were prosecuted but they they although they were prosecuted and found guilty their punishment was to pay back their expenses that was it just pay it back and what upset people a lot in in this 
um, case as well was the fact that MPs were expensing, expending all of this um, money and then asking for a pay rise. When all other public sector workers were on a pay freeze, MPs were saying, we need more money. We, we, can't, su we can't survive on the £80,000 a year that we currently get. We need more. And yet, at the same time, they were expensing all of this stuff that wasn't really supposed to be expenses. Um, another example is Jonathan Green, who embezzled £73,000 from his employer. Now, what embezzlement means is that they are um, taking the money and saying it's going to be for one thing, um, that they're paying a bill or something like that. And they're not actually doing that at all. That is going into their own personal bank account. Um, this is different to fraud because fraud is when you get people to give you money in exchange for something that you're not actually going to give them. OK, in this case, Jonathan Green um, had two clients of his business, his, his employer, instead of paying their, their bill into the company account, he had them pay the amount, the, the outstanding balance into his personal account. So instead, they didn't, the company, as far as the company was where these people hadn't paid their bills, the people were kind of like, yo, yeah, we have. Um, and Jonathan Green sat with 73 grand in his bank account. Um, and he was um, sent to prison for five years for this. Um, the final example we've got is Nicholas Levin, Levin, something like that, who orchestrated a £32 million Ponzi scheme that involved celebrities and um, very rich people. Now, what a Ponzi scheme is, is where people give you money to invest in the stock market for them with an expected rate of return. Now, Nicholas Levine didn't actually invest that money at all. He spent it. So then he got more people to invest and use their money to pay back the original people who then put more money into the account, which he then used to pay back the other people as well as spending the additional funds on himself. And it, it, it kind of spirals from there. So these people are thinking they're going to get a lot of money back. And in fact, they're actually going to get nothing at all. So if we go on to talk about um, corporate crime, according to um, Slapper and Tombs, Brilliant names, easy to remember. Um, corporate crime is often referred to as organisational crime, not organised crime. That's something completely different. Organisational crime. And this is where a company or somebody within a company um, commits a crime to the benefit of the company and not them individually. So they do something that is against the law. Um, but so that the company or the business um, benefits from it. And we've got a couple of examples here. So, for example, BP Deepwater Horizon in 2010, there was um, was when the oil rig basically exploded and massive amounts of oil went into the Louisiana Bay. And if you've got time, I do recommend watching the film with Mark Wahlberg and um, Kurt Russell very good film um, slightly dramatized but still a good film um, but BP were charged with corporate crime here because they had cut corners they had used materials that they knew to be substandard and they knew to be ineffective should there have if there was a, an oil um, leak or if there was an explosion um, in order to get more profit because oil rigs are expensive and ones like Deepwater Horizon, which is a um, transportable oil rig. So they spend a certain amount of time in one location, get what they can from there, move on to another location. It's a floating oil rig. Um, and when Deepwater Horizon blew, I think there was something like 13 deaths um, and a lot of injuries and a lot of people lost their livelihoods. And of course, there was the ecological side of it where you had not just those people that were on the oil rigs but the fishermen and the um, oyster farmers who work in the Louisiana Bay 
had their uh, their workplaces, if you like, completely destroyed because they were inundated with oil, which killed the fish and killed the birds and the oysters and um, mussel beds and all of things like that. The other example we've got is Volkswagen clean admission scandal in 2016. And what happened here was Volkswagen were promoting their new cars as saying they were zero emissions, meaning that the, the people who bought them wouldn't have to pay very much in, in car tax and things like that. But it turns out that their cars were not zero emission. They weren't clean cars. And in fact, the emissions that they were giving out were higher than they sh than is allowed. Um, and they had done some, but he had made this decision somewhere that this was uh, acceptable because they're Volkswagen. And if anyone actually says we can just say it's uh, it's one or two cars that perhaps had a fault and they could get by on the liability. But it turns out that a lot of cars um, were tested and found to be um, not clean emissions um, and they were prosecuted for it. So that takes us through the difference between white collar and corporate crime. But as I said, remember that white collar crime is about an individual gaining profit, using, uh, abusing their position in their job for personal gain. Corporate crime is about the benefit for the company. So now we're going to look at some of the reasons for the trends and a lot of this is going to be revision and recap as well because we're going to bring in the theories that we talked about in uh, theories of crime and deviance and use them to try and explain the the trends that we see so we're going to start off by looking at working class criminality and how we can explain the abundance of working class people in the prison system and in the criminal and um, represented in the criminal justice system. So the first thing we're going to talk about is selective law enforcement and selective law making, which we can link back to the Marxist theory. Those people who are making the laws tend to be in the middle and the upper classes. So they are making laws, perhaps not consciously, but still they're making laws which benefit the, it's laws which will protect them. And if you remember when we looked at this back in um, September and in lockdown last year, 90% of law in the UK is property law, which working class people don't have. And we're not talking, when we say property law, we're not talking about just housing, we're talking about stuff. Property is in cars, houses, yes, but also other material items that um, people put, place value on or have a high monetary value. And we also see selective law enforcement. And again, this links back to what we were talking about in Marxism, where if you're a working class boy who's caught graffitiing, you're more likely to be arrested than somebody who is seen in the middle classes who's going to get a slap on the wrist. Now, it's argued that this is because um, the, the, the way that um, criminality within the working class and the middle class is viewed, the working class are seen as having made a rational choice to commit that crime. Whereas the middle classes, oh, sorry, I made a mistake. I'm, I'm really sorry, I, I didn't mean to do that. So criminality within the middle classes are, by, are seen by the, the criminal justice system as, oh, they made a mistake. Now, obviously, we're not talking about things like murder or serious crimes such as those. We're talking more street level stuff, shoplifting and um, vandalism, property damage, things like that. Um, speeding is another one. You're more likely to get off a speeding ticket if you're middle class than you are if you are working class. The second thing we need to talk about is strain theory. The working class are more likely to be involved in criminal strains such as um, innovation and rebellion 
because they're more likely to feel the strain between the goals that society tells us we should achieve and the means in order to achieve them. And we can link this back to education and the fact that working class boys particularly are the highest underachieving group within education. Without education, can't get a good job, can't get a good job, can't have the material goods um, and as such that the so that society tells us makes us a successful person in society. Thirdly, we've got the invisibility of white collar and corporate crime. So working class people, as we said, tend uh, appear to commit more uh, blue collar and street crime, um, which is a not only more detectable, but um, also it, as Corral points out, the reason why we don't see so many middle class and upper class people in prisons is because the crimes, the type of crimes that they're committing are less visible. So I'm going to look at this in a little bit more detail now. So now we're going to look at why white collar and corporate crime seems to be more invisible, less likely to be prosecuted by the criminal justice system. Now, the first part is put forward by Clark in 1990 and Corral in 2001. And it's simply that white collar and corporate crime is harder to detect. It's not obvious. Somebody breaks into your house. It's obvious. Somebody beats you up. It's obvious. Somebody embezzles a couple of thousand pounds from your business. Could be an accounting error. Maybe something's just gone in the wrong place or there's a decimal point in the wrong place. It's not as easy to see to to see that a crime has taken place. Next up, the Corral also points out in 2007 this time that um, white collar and corporate crime is often seen as victimless. It's not an individual that's ended up in hospital or has um, been the person been had their property broken into particularly with white collar crime where it's often quite big corporations or quite la um, large businesses that are affected by it the, it's coming from the business it's not the individual that's losing out so again that example with um that we showed the guy that took the 73,000 pounds that didn't come from a person well it did but it, it didn't impact an individual it impacted the business but also wasn't immediately detected so again showing how it's hard to detect and it's considered victimless crime thirdly the crime may benefit both parties involved but this is particularly when we're talking about corporate crime where there may be some slightly dodgy dealings going on for trade deals between two companies or in a merger or something like that or it's a kind of you scratch my back I'll scratch yours kind of situation neither company is going to put their hand up and go yeah we broke the law to get our deal but it's their fault they're not going to do that because they're benefiting from it as much as the other company and it's almost like a mutually assured destruction if you like in that the if one company goes down they both go down if one company gets pulled up on this they're both going to get pulled up on it so they're both going to keep going to keep stum about it they're going to keep quiet about it um it's really hard to investigate white collar and corporate crime as well you need specialist skills and the police forces don't tend to have them because a lot of white collar and corporate crimes tends to be financially um, situated it tends to be financial crimes you need to employ a forensic accountant and a forensic accountant isn't cheap and there's not that many of them um, so it's not like the, uh, the everyday person can start looking at a massive corporation or a big company's financial records and kind of go oh yeah that, that's where they commit the crime it takes a lot to uh, cross checking and cross referencing and kind of working out where this money or this financial transaction or this criminal activity has occurred. 
and there's also going to be a lot of back covering. So again, look, going back to the BP Deepwater Horizon um, situation, when they were investigating that, the investigators would just pushed from pillar to post. Oh, you need to speak to this person about that. You go and see that person. Oh, you no, 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 you're not me. You need to go and speak to this person. So it's very easy within a corporation to just kind of bounce people around and they never actually or it's hard for them to actually get the information that they they want or they need. Um, there's a lack of awareness from victims as well, particularly with white collar and corporate crime. And if you if you're looking at things like Ponzi schemes or embezzlement, when it's smaller companies where it's more impactful about how they um, have been effective, they're, they're not as likely to go to the authorities, neither are big corporations. Um, in a lot of cases, the big corporations might not even be aware of what's going on because the, the financial side of things is so immense. Um, for all we know, and this is an example this is not actually true i have no evidence of this there could be some form of white collar corporate crime happening within the amazon corporation amazon is a massive transnational corporation with hundreds of thousands of employees um i read somewhere the other day that um the owner jeff benzo um earned something like four billion during the last lockdown because nobody could get out so everyone was buying everything on amazon um and if when you're dealing with finances that big, these things could be the, these corporate crimes and these white collar crimes could be going completely undetected by those companies. It's hard to categorize these 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 crimes as well. Um, the, the the line between embezzlement and fraud is very very thin um, and very blurred um is it in fact a criminal act or is it just bad business practice um where does where does that line get drawn so if you can't categorize it as a specific crime you can't bring charges which can then make it difficult to white collar corporate crime to be prosecuted there are a lot higher not guilty verdicts with white collar and corporate crime as well, which means that they don't then make it on to the statistics. And the reason why there are higher not guilty verdicts is companies that, in, that get taken to court for white collar or corporate crime have a lot of money. So they can employ business, um, lawyers who are very good at their jobs. And they can drown people in paperwork and litigation and motions and all the things about law that I really don't understand, um, which end up with and confusion for juries or for prosecutors or uh, judges, magistrates and, and things like that, which ends up with them just kind of going, yeah, I, I can't see you've done a crime, not guilty. OK, so one of the linking this back to what I was saying originally, the reason why we can see higher levels of working class criminality in the criminal justice system is because white collar and corporate crime doesn't make it there or doesn't make it onto the stats for all of the reasons that I've just gone through. Um, so, of course, it's not going to it's going to look like the work, working class are more criminal than the middle or upper classes. So if we go back to some uh, the next reason why working class people appear more criminal, subcultural theories. And we can link this um, quite nicely into um, Miller's idea of focal concerns and the idea that the work working class have a different set of focal concerns to the middle classes and uh, linking it back again to selective law enforcement the working class, the middle classes create laws around their own focal concerns. So if you've got two groups with different con focal concerns, they, they're going to butt heads at times. So if you remember the focal concerns that Miller re referred to for the working class are things like toxic masculinity, um, immediate gratification and um, things like that 
which could put them at odds with the middle class values of the criminal justice system, which leads to them being appearing more criminal. Now, that's not to say that the working class foci are wrong. They're not. They're just different. But the people in power are the ones who get to set the rules. OK. Next one, you've got social deprivation theory. So this is the idea of that the working class are deprived. They're relatively deprived. They're materially deprived. They tend to be more likely to be in poverty. And when you're in poverty, you may turn to criminal enterprise in order to make ends meet, in order to achieve the things that um, you, society tells you want to do. Again, this linking back to strain theory. OK, and finally, labelling and typifications. Now, we've talked about this before, but quite often the working class are labelled as being more criminogenic. So therefore, the criminal justice sees and sees them that way and therefore treats them that way. Hence why a working class vandal is more likely to be arrested because they're criminal anyway, than a middle class vandal who's made a mistake. OK, um, and there's a certain level of police targeting here um, uh, in the um, 90s and early 2000s when we had the hoodie situation or the, the moral panic surrounding hoodies. You walking down the street wearing a hoodie, you're more likely to be stopped by the police. Um, there, were, there were times when pe the shops were saying, if you're wearing a hoodie, you're not coming in. Now, not so much. Everyone's just kind of like, yeah, I'm living in my hoodie right now because it's lockdown. Um, but this can then make it seem like the working class are more criminal. And again, it's that chicken and egg situation. Are the working class more criminal, which created the same label and the typification? Or was is the typification led to more criminality within the working class? So we don't we're not 100 percent sure on that one. OK, so. What we need to do here is, is this could quite easily be a um, relative importance question where you'd have to decide which theory is the most reasonable to explain working class criminality. Is it the invisibility of working white corn corporate crime? Is it subcultural theory, strain theory, selective law enforcement? Which one do you think has the best explanation of why we appear to see more white um, working class people within the criminal justice system than we do middle class and upper class people. Okay. So now let's look at the explanations for why middle class and upper class people commit white collar and corporate crime, because we know it exists. We know they do it. It may not make it into the stats. It may not be prosecuted, but it's there. It exists. OK. The first explanation we're going to look at is going back to strain theory. And I go back to strain theory because this the, there's no limit to or the, there's no way. To, start that again. People can always feel relatively deprived. They can always feel like somebody else has got something better than they have or they haven't quite succeeded or they've succeeded in one aspect of their life, but not another. So and remember that strain theory is just although it focuses on utilitarian crime, um, it doesn't the, the. The American dream that Merton was using as his basis doesn't limit it to material goods. There's all and even if you've achieved everything that society tells you, you should achieve, it's always going to be someone with something better. So the, the picture I've shown you in class before where you've got the two guys looking over the fence and one's got a new washing machine and one's got a new car and they're both looking jealously at what the other one has. They've both got new things. They've both got quite new expensive things and it's surprising at how expensive a washing machine is, but they still want what the other ones had. And that can lead people into innovation and rebellion and, and things like that, which can lead them to criminal activity. Secondly, you've got Clark's rational choice theory. 
Remember that rational choice theory states that people commit crime when they weigh up the chances, that the, the benefits of committing the crime against the chances and the punishments should they get caught. Now, we know that white collar and corporate criminals are less likely to be prosecuted. And when they are prosecuted, they're more likely to get an un not guilty verdict. And the punishments given for white collar and corporate crime are pretty lax. OK, um, the, the six months a year in prison, pay back the money that you embezzled, that sort of thing. We're not talking 20, 25 years in prison here. Um, so Clark can argue that white collar and corporate criminals choose to commit the crime because they can get away with it. They're not scared of the punishments. They're not scared of getting caught because there's more probability that they're going to get away with it. Thirdly, you've got edge work and the work of cats. And we've mentioned this before. Edge work is the theory that you commit a crime for the adrenaline rush of it, for the buzz of it. And what Katz argues is with white collar and corporate crime, it's kind of knowing you've got one over perhaps on an employer that um, you don't like. Um, or in corporate crime, with things like insider trading and things like that, the buzz of um, knowing that you've got your company that good deal and you could get promotion for that or you could get a bonus for that um, can create a very high dopamine rush, which you then want to repeat. So you then continue doing the criminal activity. So the adrenaline and the dopamine that people get from getting one over on their employer, from getting away with it, from getting the praise from the company for the company doing well can then lead people to committing white collar and corporate crime. Next, we've got the idea of opportunity. Middle class and upper class people are more likely to commit white collar and corporate crime because they have the chance to. They are in the positions in the companies and in the businesses where they're able to make those to, to, to commit those crimes. A working class janitor is not going to be able to embezzle thousands of pounds from their employer because they don't have access or the opportunity to access the financial records of the company. Um, whereas the account staff, the secretarial staff, the CEOs, the board members, they all have the access to the financial information or to the deals that are being conducted to commit those crimes. So it, it, the reason why we see more white collar and corporate crime done by middle class people is because they're in those positions that have availed themselves to those opportunities. We then got the idea of criminogenic capitalism. And I chose this picture um, specifically because capital, if you remember Gordon and talking about the capitalist foci of greed, competition, materialism and um oh god what's the other one um 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 profit thank you um it it does mean that there's your capitalism in and itself is pushing you for more your company needs to do better you need to get more money coming in you need to be have more stuff you need to um be better than the other companies that are in the same field as you so it's criminogenic capitalism or capitalism as a system is constantly pushing for more. And that can lead people to committing crime to get that more, um, which is why Gordon sees capitalism as being criminogenic. Those four foci which are constantly pushing and pushing and pushing create the criminal activity or lead to that criminal activity. The final one I'm going to talk about is masculinity theory. And this is put forward by Messerschmitt, who argues that middle class men are engaging in white collar and corporate crime as a way to show off their masculinity. In a society where we are seeing more and more women taking part in those higher levels of employment and the higher levels of business, some it's led to a slight crisis of masculinity 
where you've got households perhaps where the man is not the breadwinner and the the woman or the partner is the breadwinner um where a society where the equality of men and women is leading some men to think well what does it now mean to be a man and they turn to that hegemonic and dominant masculinity that we talked about in gender and crime which says you need to be like this and engaging in those behaviors it can lead to them committing white collar and corporate crime which they also see as a slight slightly more safe way of asserting their masculinity because again as we've said before it is um white collar and corporate crime is less likely to be prosecuted okay so to just to summarize then street collar um, street collar street crime and blue collar crime is more likely to be committed by working class people and this leads to working class people being um, seen in the criminal justice system more because of selective law enforcement because of strain theory the invisibility of white collar and corporate crime the subcultures and foci um, that Miller referred to social deprivation theory labeling and typifications whereas white collar and corporate crime is more likely to be committed by the middle classes and the upper classes and this is because again we can think about strain theory there's also rational choice edge work opportunity criminogenic capitalism and masculinity theory so what you need to do now is go to your isb in notebook and once you've finished taking your notes and there is lots of more information um, and resources on your on the outline page on your isb um, make sure that your notes are up to date and and complete by using the grids questions and then annotate those grid questions highlight them prioritize them to show how well you understand it and that is how you're going to show me that you have taken notes on this lecture any questions any queries contact me via chat or email